the Art Forum Lecture Series here at the VCA. And before I introduce our guest speaker, I do want to take a moment to invite everybody here to ground yourself in the deep knowledge that long before the VCA was thought of or the University of Melbourne was considered, that the, the Bunwurrung and Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation practiced song and dance on this land. They made paintings, they made sculpture, they shared stories, they practiced healing. And um, for countless generations, and we don't take it lightly that we get to do what we do on this land. And it's with great pleasure and honor that I acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. Look, it really is my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today, our colleague and uh, dear friend, Natalie King. Natalie King is a curator and writer and researcher based in now Melbourne. Her current projects include curator of Yukikihara Paradise Camp, Aotearoa, New Zealand at the 59th Venice Biennale. And she's also the series editor of the mini monographs uh, with Thames and Hudson. And welcome to the Thames and Hudson staff who have joined us today. Um, in 2017, Natalie was curator of Tracy Moffat, My Horizon, uh, the, at the Australian Pavilion for the 57th Venice Biennale. She's realized curatorial projects in Indonesia, India, Japan, Korea, Singapore, Taiwan, Italy, Thailand, Bangladesh, New Zealand, New Caledonia, and Vietnam, where she's explored all sorts of ideas around ind indigeneity, intersectionality, feminism, and new media. In 2020, Natalie was awarded the Medal of the Order of Australia for service to contemporary visual arts. And she, of course, is an, an enterprise, enterprise professor, professor uh, in, in visual, visual arts here at the Victorian College of the Arts. And on a, on a personal note, she's, um, she's a, a very, very generous mentor who's uh, shared her knowledge and, um, and just has a willingness for artists to um, share their work with the world. So please join me, whether you're in Zoom land or whether you're, you're in Federation Hall with us now, uh, a, a big, big welcome, welcome for Natalie, Natalie King. King. Thank you, David, for your warm introduction and for inviting me to Art Forum today. It's, to be honest, it's a very long time since I've delivered a live lecture as I've been tethered to Zoom for two and a half years. So it's great to be here today. And thank you all of our, everyone for joining us on Zoom as well. I would also like to acknowledge the Bunwarang as, as the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and pay my, pay my respects to their ancestors and elders past, present and emerging. It's terrific to see so many colleagues, comrades, artists and friends here today. I feel like I'm in um, good company. I've always said that being at the VCA as a curator is like Nirvana. So, you know, I very much love being based and headquartered here. I've titled my lecture today, Curating with Care, as I believe that to care is to recognize all bonds between both humans and non-humans, between humans and their systems, their infrastructures and institutions, and to attend to their fragility. And ethics of care challenges us to construct social relations and systems that allow us to turn to process, uh, processes of care, repair, maintenance, and healing. These concepts, theories, and practices of care offer diverse ways of relating and living, of perceiving and making, both as a society and as individuals engaged in mutual responsibility, attentiveness, and responsiveness. Concepts of care can also provide an ethical and political framework for action. So, so what are the intertwinements of curating and care? What are the negotiations, tensions, mishaps required to enact and sustain curatorial care? How can care be cross-examined, celebrated, probed and defended? How can the methodology of care be embedded in a curatorial practice that is intermittent and, and at times precarious, very much like working as an artist? 
How can care be posited within unequal relations? And how can these dichotomies be held together while ensuring a practice of care that is relational, contested and provisional? What kind of generative structures emerge from collaboration, collective or negotiated positions? And it's this background of care that I wanted to frame my presentation today. Today, as David mentioned, I will primarily focus on my curation of Aotearoa New Zealand Pavilion at the current Venice Biennale with Yukiki Hara's Paradise Camp. This is the first time that I've lectured on this project, and so it is in many ways a live case study. But before I, before I commence, can I do a, a mini survey? Who has been to the current Venice Biennale? Put your hands up. Ah, very good. Who has attended previous Venice Biennales? Put your hands up. Great. And who would like to participate in a Venice Biennale? Put your hand up. Okay, I understand the room. So I'm going to share with you today as much behind the scenes um, knowledge that I can about curating two Venice Biennales. There'll be time for questions at the end. You can literally ask me anything. I'll share the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of curating two Venice Biennales. I have to also tell you that many of my projects over the past two and a half years have been in free fall, requiring rescuing, Alice and Carol can attest to this, rescheduling, reprising, extension to funding contracts, on the brink of cancellation, postponement, and numerous unknowns. So in 2017, I curated Tracy Moffat's exhibition, My Horizon at the Venice Biennale. And she was the first solo presentation by an indigenous artist in the Australian Pavilion. And following on from this Biennale, I've been pondering whether to consider another Biennale. The undertaking is epic, unremitting, exhilarating, yet exhausting. As many of you know, the Venice Biennale is the most prestigious visual arts event in the world. It was inaugurated in 1895 in the Lagoon city of Venice to commemorate the silver wedding anniversary of the Italian king and queen, Umberto I and Margarita di Savoia. The first edition in 1895, believe it or not, attracted 224,000 visitors and great public acclaim. In the council meeting of the 30th of March, 1894, the decision was made to adopt a by invitation system to reserve a section of the exhibition for foreign artists too, to admit works by uninvited Italian artists. The mayor announced the first exhibition for the following year and the Venice Biennale Council worked out of a little council library. On the 8th of July, 1910, futurist Marinetti arranged a drop of anti-Biennale leaflets in Piazza San Marco. During the Second World War, the activities of the Biennale were interrupted in 1942 to resume only in 1948. The only other time that the Venice Biennale has been deferred was during COVID, the one that I did. <laughs> with a delay from one year from 2021 to 2022. <laughs> Currently, the Biennale is held across the city in palazzos, parks, warehouses and cafes. The, tra the traditional site of the Biennale is the Giardini on the eastern edge of Venice where Napoleon made gardens at the beginning of the 19th century. The Giardini hosts 29 pavilions including Joseph Hoffman's Austrian Pavilion, Gerrit Rietveld's Dutch Pavilion, and the Finnish Pavilion designed by Alva Alto. These national country pavilions are purpose-built, architecturally designed permanent pavilions along promenades within the gardens. And here you can see where the Australian Pavilion is. 
The nation state presentations form part of a competitive environment with differing timelines, budgets, media teams depending on resourcing and prominence with the golden line awarded to the best contributions assessed by a jury. The other primary venue is the Arsenal, a former, former shipyard and armory clustered together from the 12th century in a colonnade of long warehouse rooms with concrete floor and brick walls. Despite its heritage overlay, these interlocking halls where national convenience can be rented from the Alley for varying amounts depend on their size and centrality, coexist. And it's there that the New Zealand Pavilion is currently alongside Albania. There is, however, surprisingly, limited cross-pollination between pavilions, as most artists, curators and teams are focused on delivering their own exhibitions in climatically hostile conditions with extreme humidity, floods, dust, and the complexity of freighting artworks to a lagoon environment, where barges with forklifts are used to manoeuvre crates. Logistically challenging, each country assembles and appoints a team attached to its government as part of La Biennale rules. Focused on nation state representations like the Olympic Games, there are systemic inequalities of funding and capacity. Australia has been participating in the Venice Biennale since 1988, and our pavilion was formerly a two level exhibition space like a veranda, with, like a beach house with a veranda designed by Phillips, Philip Cox. Oops. Due to its temporary nature, in 2015, the Australian Pavilion was redesigned and rebuilt by John Denton into a large black geometrical structure over an adjacent lagoon. It's architectonic and monolithic. The new design is the most current building in Venice due to strict building regulation codes. Denton's black box was inaugurated by Kate Blanchett in 2015 with an exhibition by Fiona Foley. And in 2017, the Australia Council invited five artists to submit proposals with Tracy Moffat uh, submission being chosen with Commissioner Naomi Milgram. I was appointed subsequently by the Australia Council who managed, uh, they were the managing agency for the exhibition, uh, My Horizon. So I started railing and reflecting about the complexities of curation in Venice, its visibility and invisibility, duration and impact, casualties and causalities. And now I'd like to uh, present and share with you my curation of Yukiki Hara's Paradise Camp for the 59th Venice Biennale in 2022, postponed one year. This project was delivered in the context of pandemic curation, where deferral, isolation and uncertainty prevailed. As a live case study of a Biennale conceived and delivered under difficult conditions with unforeseen outcomes, adaptations, shifting timelines, funding constrictions and travel limitations were just some of the conditions upon which this Biennale was conceived, researched and realized in the context of pandemic curation. On the 23rd of May, 2019, Creative New Zealand advertised an open call for an artist and curated duo to apply for what was the 2021 Venice Biennale for Aotearoa, New Zealand. New Zealand has been participating in the Venice Biennale since 2001, including presentations by Lisa Rehana, um, which was presented concurrently when I did Tracy Moffat. Previous artists include Michael Parakofi, uh, Francis Pritchard, and Dane Mitchell, with curators Zara Stanhope and Rana Devonport, amongst others. So each country has very different methodologies for procuring their artist and curator, different timelines and processes. There are varying methodologies, including open call, selective shortlisting, invitational, 
appointing curator who researches an artist and so on. And some countries uh, like, like Japan, Japan don't, don't actually reveal their process. Some countries have at times attempted to disrupt the nation state format by swapping pavilions. So France and Germany exchanged pavilions in 2013. And exhibiting artists from other countries in a fluid state um, really disrupts this notion of uh, nationhood. So I want to show you this image so you can see the, um, the chaos before uh, the exhibition opens and the disruption pre-Venissage. The gardens in the Jardin are overgrown. Uh, they're filled with dust, crates, forklifts, ladders, scaffolding, scissor lifts, tools, feverish artists and their crews. Ultimately, the Giardini is miraculously manicured and tidied before the arrival of the art conoscenti, the media throng and collectors who enjoy cicchetti or Venetian tapas and parties. Fortunately, Creative New Zealand is one of the first countries to advertise for a curator and artist team. The submission was due at 5 p.m. on Friday the 19th of July 2019, with the announcement advised in September. As one of the first countries to announce, this ensures more time for the creative team to plan and secure a venue, as New Zealand doesn't have a permanent pavilion, unlike Australia. I saw the open call in May and swiftly decided to reach out to interdisciplinary artist Yuki Kihara via social media. Kihara is of Japanese and Samoan heritage and based in Apia. We had never worked together before, though I was aware that she had held a solo acquisitive exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York in 2008 with an exhibition called Living Photographs. And I was particularly uh, fascinated by this triptych called in the manner of a woman. This triptych, um, you can see one of the images here, recalls colonial photography of the dusky maiden. And it's here that Kihara casts herself in a sepia um, image in a studio. She poses reclining and on a chaise like an odalisque, a trope adopted by photographers working in Samoa, such as Thomas Andrew and Alfred John Tattersall in which sitters were posed partially clothed among props and backdrops of tropical foliage. Part of the Fa'afafina community in Samoa, Kihara identifies as in the manner of a woman, assigned male at birth and expressing her gender as female. I had been longing to work with Kihara for some time knowing that she had exhibited in a number of biennales, including the Bangkok Biennale, the, Han the Honolulu Biennial, the Sakahan Biennale, and the Asia Pacific Triennial in 2005 and 2015. I saw her Salome series at Queensland Art Gallery, and we had an Asian dinner in Brunswick Street in 2008, while she was undertaking a residency at Multicultural Arts Victoria. She also gave an art forum lecture when we were formerly in that tin shed um, and Gary Foley was in the audience. So I had remembered these encounters very well and longed to work with her. So with a mix of trepidation and enthusiasm, I connected with Kihara, who was actually reticent and reluctant to progress. Later, I had discovered that she had been disappointed by two previous curators, um, who had, a plot, who had attempted an application that did not proceed on two occasions. So we started an exchange via Facebook Messenger and video apps. Yuki was convinced that she wouldn't be picked. So I used all of my efforts of persistence and persuasion to encourage her to form an alliance with me, knowing that I had already curated a Venice Biennale with a track record of international exhibitions and publications. So we started preparing our application and I soon discovered how tenacious, unassailable and indefatigable Kihara is. She has a strong research methodology and she's based between Samoa and New Zealand. 
So here's a map of uh, Samoa. The population is about 200,000. And Yuki is based in Apia, which is the capital. Um, and she initially trained in fashion at Wellington Polytechnic. And you'll see in her work how she very much uh, deploys staging and mise-en-scene in her practice. After graduating in 1996, she worked mostly as a freelance costume designer and wardrobe manager for choreographers, theatre directors, TV and film. She also staged fashion shows in raves and worked as a fashion editor for various magazines and newspapers right up until 2000. It was during this period that she was exposed to the creative process of the theatricality and how she could use it to tell her own narratives. She calls this methodology indragenous. This was a challenging period in Kihara's life because she also transitioned into living as a trans woman. It became a barrier to getting jobs in the creative. So the creative industry um, was really one of the only outlets. She was frequently on unemployment benefits with sometimes just $5 to her name. The theatricality in um, Kihara's practice is also partly due to watching Fafa female beauty pageants in Samoa, which uh, feature elaborate sets, drag shows, glamorous gowns and costumes. These uh, pageants form a fantasy world literally from the ground up. There were several Fafa female beauty pageants during the 1980s and 90s run by vari various charity driven organizations. But the pageant that was the most prominent for Kihara was the My Girls production from the 90s, led by the late Tanya, who you'll see in an, Im in an image which I'll show you soon. She was a multitasker, an MC, and she choreographed, produced, and directed uh, various pageants. Fafafine pageantry is not just entertainment, but it provided visibility for Fafafine at the time when they were used as scapegoats for causing AIDS and natural disasters by religious lead leaders and the media. In 2016, the Fafafina community welcomed the replacing of the Crimes Ordinance Act of 1961, a law enforced during the New Zealand colonial administration of Samoa that criminalized the impersonation of a female by a male in Samoa. The law was used to persecute Fafafina with fines or imprisonment as a penalty. So this is some of the background to preparing our application. For five solid weeks, we prepared our detailed submission. I don't think I've ever worked on a submission of such complexity. A high level of detail was required, including a freight quote with crates, customs clearance into Venice, book content and, global, and a global distribution plan, letters of support. All segments of the budget um, had very specific guidelines. So we had to wrangle with costs. And for me, the miracle of the submission was that um, Kihara already had a fully conceived proposal that had been developed five years prior. So I felt very lucky to have a carefully considered concept that really required limited modification. Her title, Paradise Camp, scope, methodology of shooting new photographs on Upalo Island with a cast and crew who you can see here, um, very much is like working as a cinematographer. The proposal required a global distribution plan for the publication and Kirsten Abbott from Thames and Hudson, the team can attest to that. Um, so we had very, um, you know, it was quite an onerous submission. But looking back at the pro proposal from July 2019, most of the components remained intact almost three years later. So Paradise Camp is the title of the exhibition. And it was inspired by an essay by Emeritus Professor Nahuya Te Awakotaku called Gauguin's Models, a Maori Perspective. This, um, she presented a paper in 1992 at Auckland Art Gallery. 
And in this paper, she discusses how Gauguin deliberately painted his models to appear androgynous and exotic as a reflection of his personal and sexual fascination with the mahu, the equivalent of fafafine within the indigenous culture of Tahiti, as described in his journal Noa Noa. For Paradise Camp, uh, Kihara excavates early accounts of fafafine and indigenous communities, retrieving documents, images, and narratives that become a riveting early Polynesian queer history. Paradise Camp um, comprises photographs, moving image, and an archive. For our submission, we needed support letters. So we, uh, we got letters from the director of Mori Art Museum, Tokyo, the senior deputy director of LACMA, um, the curators at the Met, uh, the director of Art Gallery of South Australia, the high chief of the district of Alepata in Upolo Island, amongst others. So it was really a collation of a lot of support. And in September, 2019, the former chair of Creative New Zealand and commissioner contacted Yukiki Hara, who thought that he was asking for clarification about our budget. It turned out that he read a pre-prepared speech formally inviting Kihara to present, represent New Zealand. At the time, Kihara was home in Apia, Samoa. And this is her account. She yelled with such glee that her mother rushed into her bedroom office to ask what was wrong, only to, to discover the exciting news to which she responded, where is Venice? <laughs> the formal announcement of our unanimous selection by an independent panel of 17, um, assessing 17 submissions was made public some weeks later with a formal press release. It's important to note that Kihara is the first Pacifica Fafafine Asian and Indigenous artist to Samoa to be selected by New Zealand. This is a triumph. So following on from our um, appointment, in November 2019, um, Kihara, myself, and the manager from Creative New Zealand went to Venice to source potential venues because as I mentioned before, New Zealand doesn't have a permanent pavilion. So we jettisoned across the city, across the lagoon, under bridges. We were ferried alongside uh, gleaming black gondolas across tiny lagoons towards the widened stretch of the Grand Canal. <clears throat> we passed Byzantine facades, glorious and decaying medieval and Renaissance palazzos with glimpses of glass chandeliers glowing from the canal. Many of the venues that we looked at were in a state of dereliction and disrepair. We viewed, we viewed venues with brocade, brocade curtains, terrazzo floors, floors and, and walls festooned with, with sconces, sconces and recess, recess paintings. paintings. Trying, Trying to, to imagine, imagine how, how a suite of incandescent, incandescent photographic portraits of Fafafine or, or the third gender, gender community might, might be presented in Venice. Venice. We moved across shimmering terraces, waterfront palazzos, garages stained in water from previous tides. But, but the priority for us was to select a venue that's central and give us some prominence. Kihara's brief, and she kept telling us on this site visit, was to find a venue that Elton John would like. <laughs> so we kept searching. We were there for the final weeks of the 2019 Venice Biennale. Some pavilions had already gone home and others had closed without dismantling their exhibitions, possibly due to the treacherous and damaging Aqua Alta with its symphony of sirens indicating pending tidal waves across the city. And while we were there, we could hear the sirens and locals explaining their sinister meaning and impact on such a small economy. The city was slippery and flooded, and we navigated it beset by tourists and cruise liners. There is a small population that live in Venice of around 60,000, and they speak a distinctly Venetian dialect. 
we arrived the day after the most significant aqua alta in 50 years, and the city was eerily damp and gloomy. We immediately went and bought gumboots. We decided to go and look at the Arsenale, and we looked at the Atelieres space, which is centrally located on the ground floor with its own entrance. We were both adamant that we wanted to secure a prominent space, despite its high rental. So when you um, find, secure a pavilion or a venue in Venice, you pay for it, depending on its location and its prominence. And when you rent from um, the you rent a space in the Arsenale, you pay your rent to La Biennale. So the bigger the space, the higher the rent. Most people don't know that. So we decided that we wanted to be in the Arsenale, but we would compromise and have half a pavilion. And we uh, ended up sharing with Albania, who is represented for the first time at the Venice Biennale. For us, coexistence, adjacency, sharing equipment, and camaraderie were important to us. The New Zealand government um, had multiple attempts to try and dissuade us from going into this prominent venue because there are heritage restrictions and we wouldn't be able to use this venue for hospitality um, with patrons and guests. But we were adamant and um, the onus was eventually on the artist and myself to raise the deficit in the rent. So here are just some photos of um, meeting with La Biennale team in the top right, uh, Yuki in St. Mark's Square and visiting La Biennale office. So we found our venue, we needed to secure more funds. And then <clears throat> a few months later, I went to Samoa to um, really be a witness uh, to the photo shoot. And this is March, 2020. Uh, the photo shoot took place on Upulu Island with a cast and crew of locals of over 100 uh, people, including drivers, hair and makeup, a prop department, costuming models, um, a coordinator, food, of course, catering. We were headquartered at Salatoga Sands Resort, using the conference room for meetings, briefings and meals. And... Um, Kihara's practice is very much socially engaged, whereby she works very closely with her community and um, her community become the subjects and the medium of her work. We visited uh, this beach um, as part of a tour by the Samoan Fafafine Association who were very welcoming to me. On the surface, this image has pristine qualities Yet Kihara has transposed the image into a vast wallpaper which we use in the pavilion. It's an oceanscape that was decimated in the 2009 tsunami. Despite its picturesque qualities resembling tourist brochures with palm trees and sandy beaches, the backdrop also includes Nu'utele Islet in the distance, which was a former leper colony during the German and New Zealand period of colonization. So in many ways, this image um, points to the impact of colonization and the environmental crises on the island. Ihara caps the notion of paradise by using subversion to question the notions of the Pacific, often associated with unpolluted and vacant white sandy beaches that are constantly recreated by the tour tourism industry. Following on from my visit to Samoa, Two weeks later, COVID struck. And uh, there were many setbacks, including the New Zealand government wanting us to defer, to cancel, to change our budgets, but um, we were insistent that we needed to forge ahead. Zoom replaced in-person studio visits and the tangible encounter with artists and artworks. So I just wanted to show you now, um, Oops. My name is Natalie Kinney. I'm a curator based in Melbourne, and I'm really thrilled to be working with an artist like Yuki, who is immeasurably creative, uh, habitually outspoken, very politicised and socially engaged artist, 
who is working with uh, many communities here in Samoa to produce a new body of work for Venice. My new body of work that's going to be shown at the Venice Biennale uh, is entitled Paradise Camp. Uh, Paradise Camp was inspired by an essay. It was written by Nahuya Teo Kotoku. Uh, we described how some of the models in Paul Bougan's paintings may have been Mahu. I also looked at the paintings of Paul Bougan on the occasion of my solo exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York in 2008, and then realized that the models in the painting not only looked Samoan, but they also looked Fasafine. Um, hence why we have uh, Samoan Fasafine models. Upcycling Paul Bougan paintings as a way to critique the colonial heteronormative gaze from an indigenous perspective. Paradise Camp has been eight years in the making. The process involved a series of consultations with members of my Aina, traditional landowners, the government, and the Fafafine and Fatama community in Samoa. Gaining the support of the local community helped to stage a high level production which featured over 35 cast and 20 crew members based locally. The photo shoot took place in some of the most beautiful locations across the Polo Island that are currently under threat by the impact of climate change. Paradise Camp is the most ambitious project to date in my art practice. I'll turn the sound off. So we produce quite a lot of um, video trailers. It's really important to have strong documentation and digital outlets for your work, especially when you're working internationally and so that you have all this kind of content available for, for media and for um, online audiences. Um, so this is a bit about the Paradise Camp project. Sorry, how do I move along? How do I go up? So here you can see the Gauguin work, um, the models that uh, Kihara has cast, and then the actual image. So this is a very daring and audacious repurposing and upcycling of Gauguin as uh, Yuki always tells me, improving the work. Uh, this is called When Will You Marry? Uh, go down on the left, uh, the models on the right, and then uh, Kihara's work. Uh, this is called Three for Afafine, go down on the left, and Kihara's work on the right. Uh, we also had a single channel uh, video called um, Paradise Camp TV. And I'll just show you a little bit of this work because I know we're running out of time. It's a hilarious and witty uh, five-part episodic talk show where a group of Fafafine sit together and uh, improvise critique of Gauguin, who they've never heard of. This is first impressions. Our first painting, but I want to elucidate for a John. John, please bring the next painting. Oh. 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 <clears throat> oh. This painting is called Two Tunisian Women. Okay. 
Two Tahitian women. Tyler. What's a Christian? Two Tahitian trans women? Adele. I like what it did. I was liking it. I changed my little. <laughs> um, perhaps the, um, the most daring work is the final image that was produced in the series where uh, Kihara went indoors to a studio in New Zealand and worked with the prosthetics team from um, Peter Jackson, the filmmaker to transform herself as Gauguin, which I guess is um, a pretty audacious act to step into the shoes of a European white heterosexual male. And this is the show in Venice. <coughs> Paradox Town is an ensemble exhibition of 12 new luscious photographs shot in location in summer, from rural villages to churches, plantations and heritage sites with a, with a local cast and crew of close to 100 people. Photographs, repurposed and upcycled paintings by Paul Gauguin, created during his time in Tahiti and the Marquesas. Yuki situates her photographs against a vast wallpaper of an oceanscape decimated by the 2009 tsunami. The suite of photographs is accompanied by an archive section highlighting Yuki's deep research in Polynesian queer histories. as well as a single channel moving image called First Impressions or Gauguin. Perhaps the most astonishing photograph is an elaborate portrait where Yuki returns indoors to a studio in Auckland, casting herself as Gauguin. Through the ingenious role reversal, Kihara commands her own space within the traditions of art history while ending the conventions of portraiture itself. By addressing the intersectionality between decolonization, identity politics, and environmental crises, Paradise Pan takes the temple of our times from a staunchly Pacifica perspective. Enjoyed our sound, soundtrack sung by Cindy of Samoa, who we commissioned to sing a Paradise Camp song. She's the most famous drag entertainer in Samoa and she um, usually performs as Tina Turner. Here are just some installation shots. And our book, uh, expertly published by Kirsten Abbott, publishing director at Thames and Hudson. We very much wanted to do a standalone publication that would have longevity beyond the seven month exhibition cycle and commissioned over 10 new essays, poems, reflections and interviews. Um, Thames and Hudson have ensured significant Northern Hemisphere distribution and the book has sold out twice in La Biennale Bookstore. Here are some of the reviews. Um, I, I've never worked on anything that's had so much attention. Uh, from Arte TV, um, which is syndicated in six languages, 
to 1.2 million people in Europe, to The Guardian, the art newspaper, uh, USL, and the list goes on. We are currently working towards a forum in um, October, which will be a hybrid format online and in person. So please tune in. It will be held with Carfosbury University of Venice and Cove at the University of Melbourne. And thanks, Cove, for your support. Uh, Talanoa is a pan-Pacific word that means open dialogue and uh, transparent conversation. So this is a bit about what Talanoa is. We very much wanted to bring dialogue and discourse to Yuki's practice. The title of uh, the Talanoa Forum is Swimming Against the Tide. And this title is um, extracted from the Maori um, feminist activist, Narata Mita and filmmaker, who said, swimming against the tide makes you stronger. Uh, Nahuya Te Wakotaku will be presenting a keynote and this is the postcards that we've just designed. But all these initiatives are separate to the New Zealand government support. So we've had to fundraise for this, um, these events. So what's next? Paradise Camp will travel to the Powerhouse uh, Museum in Sydney next year with new commissions, with some community engagement and some interventions with the collection. Because it's very important that uh, there is an afterlife beyond for the artists, beyond the Venice Biennale, and uh, you know so much work and effort goes into these projects that it has the opportunity to tour. And I wanted to close with some ideas about caring, sort of come full circle about the role of care um, that underpins um, my curatorial modality, um, and how we can find ways to care in times of you know tumult and uncertainty. And by always putting the artist first, a good exhibition behaves like a guest who takes care to do whatever is true to the spirit of the work. Thank you. Thanks so much, Natalie. We've got, um, oh, hang on, let me just thank you properly. Um, hang on, where are you? Come on here. Mm -hmm. um, just really on behalf of everybody in Zoomland and, and everyone here in Federation Hall, thanks for taking us through that. And um, really, congratulations on a stunning career that's by no means over because from the feel of it, there are projects bubbling away all the time. We've got some time for questions. I wonder if anybody in our audience got time for a couple of questions. There's a question for Natalie. Yeah, please. Um, I was really struck by, I mean, it's been an incredible success, the show, and the amount of media that I'm aware of here is just phenomenal. I mean, I've never seen anything like this for anything in this part of the world in Europe like this, so congratulations to you for that. But I was struck by your comment about that, that Yuki had conceptualised this five years ago, and I'm just thinking, sorry, I've got to think back to what Max said, so. That, um, the timing is so perfect now that the issues of indigenous cultures and gender issues and particularly are, are it seems to be much more pertinent now than they were five years ago or much more visible now. And how it would have been, in a way, it was a, a very fortunate thing that it was delayed five years. I just wanted to comment on that. Mm. Well, it was delayed one year, but I do think the timing is has been really crucial. She conceptualized but she had conceptualized, before. she conceptualized the five years prior, which as I said, was a gift to me, but she didn't have the opportunity and the resources to realize it. And I suppose um, the current Venice Biennale is really a game changer. It's predominantly uh, women, women, gender non-conforming yeah. and First Nations artists. There are. Um, so the time is incredible. The, the time is incredible. And I don't know if somehow I had a sense of that when I reached out to her. I also knew that Lisa Rehana, the Maori artist, had been enormously successful in 2017. And I felt that she paved the way for an artist like Yuki. So the timing all kind of coalesced. And in terms of having an extra year, um, the year um, allowed us to. Produce a book. There's enormous effort that goes into the 
the commissioning and the preparation of a publication of this magnitude. So we did have an extra year. So we used the year very purposefully. Also, my um, my research area is not Polynesian queer history. So we formed a reading group and we met every week with various interlocutors and we read for every week from you know, Kelly, her author is Queer of Ireland, um, and we had a very extensive reading list, and that was probably one of the highlights of lockdown, even though we were you know, not much to write by Zoom, and we usually with the artist. So we just tried to use our time. So that the final presentation, you think, is that, is that significant for us? I, I think so. We also, it, it's a team effort. So we had you know, Kirsten from Sunday Hudson, an exhibition designer. We had the space was a small sort of U shaped space, but the walls were five meters high. So we tried them in wallpaper. So we, we stand out. We sort of stand out in Venice. So the exhibition designer kind of devised a lot of these sort of patches, and the entrance is kind of yellow. So just some small ways of presenting your work. So that, and also, look is there. So she made a commitment. We were not able to send over docents. Typically, you'd send over docents. We've got a security guard. So her, uh, we've made the commitment to really self-fund her presence in Venice for the virtually the full seven-month cycle. So she's on site giving talks every day with her little green box. Um, so it's a you know it's an enormous commitment, but you only get Venice once. That's what I always tell her. <laughs> you gotta do the hustle. Oh, oh, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm like, yeah. sorry, everyone. <laughs> Online, um, I can read out for you. Um, what changes would you like to see uh, from the Biennale Foundation in terms of the structural inequalities and often near colonial resources that can be found in every edition of the, bi the biennial arts? You know, that is such a great question. Well, the first thing that Yuki wanted to do was make sure that there are all gender bathrooms, which there are not. And that's one of her criteria for exhibiting. And she brought that up when we had meetings with Love Biennale to make some noise. That's a very tangible way uh, to be inclusive. The structural inequalities, it's, you know, nations, you know, what France assigns to their artists is different to Albania and New Zealand. So there is, um, enormous pressure. You know, I'm looking at doc the current documenta where they had a very large budget, but they gave every single artist or collective the same amount. Now, can you imagine that happening? There's usually such a hierarchy in biennials where, you know, the star artists get their, I don't know, I don't know what the commission budgets are, but I'd imagine they're in the several hundred thousand. Um, so I, I hope there are ways that we can change the system but the systems um, it is antiquated the same system's been there since 1895 but maybe countries need to work together um, they're quite divided I don't know why countries don't share resources so it doesn't make sense for New Zealand to bring in a scissor lift and Albania hires one as well so no one even shares equipment there even having centralized equipment would help resource some of the smaller um, pavilions. So just some initial thoughts. We're gonna we're gonna leave it there. Um, but Natalie, thanks so much for um, for your generosity and and yeah, can I can just imagine what a journey that was for you, but also for the artists, um, you know, both Tracy and Yuki, um, to work with you so closely to develop projects. It's very exciting and um, you know, we look forward to what else you've got cooking. So please, on behalf of everyone here, a big thank you.